by James Bridie. Adapted for radio by Gordon Gildard. Storm in a Teacup Yes, Maggie? There's a man to see you, Mum. What sort of man? Well, it's not just quite easy to describe him, Mum. Has he a collar on? Aye. A clean one? Aye. Then show him in. Righto. And Maggie, don't say righto. Oh, OK. <sighs> no, thank you. This is him. Good evening. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I called to see the provost. I expect him at any moment now. Um, won't you sit down? Mrs Thompson? Yes. Ah, my name's Burden, Mrs Thompson, Frank Burden. I'm from the advertiser. The what? Oh, the newspaper. Oh, yes, how nice. The editor's wife's a great friend of mine. Yes. Mr Skirving, the editor, he had arranged an interview with the provost. He was to take it himself. I mean, the provost's a very important man. Only, Only Mr, Mr. Skirving... Skirving had to go to Birmingham. I know that. Yes. He won't be back till the meeting tomorrow. And uh, Mr Smith, that's the assistant editor, he's in bed with Lumbago, so I'm sort of running the show. How exciting for you. Oh, I don't know. There's only six of us on the staff and I'm the only one left who can spell. Um, I'm sorry to have shoved my way in like this. I I'll wait for him outside. Oh, you don't want to wait on the doorstep, do you? It's a cold, cold doorstep. Sit down and have some tea. Well, I, I mean, but... Will that be all right? I hope so. There's a cup and tea is infused. I am quite unprotected, but you have a kind face. Oh, all right. Thanks very much. Sugar? Well, please. How many? Two? Three? Well, I'll see how big they are first. Uh, five, please. You will be loathsomely obese when you're 40. No, I don't think so. None of my family is fat. Uh, we don't run to it. That's nice. Ah, thank you. You're not a native of these parts, Mrs. Thompson. Why do you ask? Well, uh, asking me to tea like that, knowing nothing about me. You're a pressman, aren't you? Oh, yes, but... And uh, proud of it? Well, yes, in a way. But the advertiser isn't much of a paper. Oh, Mr. Burden. Well, you'd never heard of it till you came to live here. Oh, but I had. It was my stupidity. My husband says it's the most influential paper in Scotland. Oh, it is, in a way. I mean, it's the only paper that features the party. Not that it's very big, only... You're interested in politics, Mrs. Thompson? Yes. Well, you'll be right in the middle of them soon, when Provost Thompson gets into Parliament. He'll get in, you think? Oh, sure to. I never saw them so mad about anybody. Tories, socialists and all. And it's only a step. A man like the Provost with a dozen Scots independents behind him in the house and we'll have a Parliament in Edinburgh before you can say knife. <laughs> you are in a hurry. Well, now we've got a leader, there's no reason why we should waste any time. And if I may say so... Now that I've seen, uh, well, a bit of his family... Like. Have some more tea. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, add a little to this. It's too weak. Two lumps this time. Too much sugar seems to go to your head. <laughs> Pardon me, but sugar has nothing to do with it. Oh, these look nice. Would you like one? Hmm, thanks. <clears throat> you know, we, we don't realise enough what a public man's wife does for him. So you think my husband will be elected? Well, I rather hope not now. Indeed? Why? Well, I do the speeches at the civic functions. I mean, I report them. It would be nice to have something to look at. Me? Mm-hmm. Mr Burden, you're an impertinent young devil. <laughs> well, that, Mrs Thompson, I'm afraid, does run in the family. If you please, Mum. Well, Maggie, there's a lady to see you, Mum. A lady? Didn't she give her name? Well, I didn't ask. Well, she's not right, a lady, Mum. I sometimes fail to follow your subtle distinctions, Maggie. What do you mean by not right, a lady? Well, she's more a kind of a... a kind of a woman, if you understand me. Ask this... person. Is that right, Maggie? Aye, that's it. She's a person. Ask this person to come in. OK. And don't say OK. All oh, right, oh. If I say person to please her, I don't see why she shouldn't say yes, ma'am, to please me, do you? Well, I don't know. The Scots are gay ill to teach anything they don't want to learn. Yes. It's very disappointing. Uh, this is her. 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mrs. Flanagan, it is. Mrs. Honoria Flanagan. You know all of it, my Mr. Provost, Your Honor, same as I know all about you. Uh, but and Mrs. that Flanagan... one word now, I know what you're going to say. Don't say it. It's all very fine and large, and it's the law and all. Don't I know it? Uh, Mrs. Flanagan, when you finish uh, your just aria, the... one word to say to us on our here. Uh, but listen. What for should I be listening listen. to him fit to talk me out of all reason and common listen, sense Mrs. and me to say yes, sir, yes, sir? All murdered like an out. I go with no satisfaction for me and Patsy at all. At but all. Th- you're making. Making a mistake, a Mrs. Mistake, Flanagan. I... Is it? That's what you all say. It's a mistake. Come next week and round I come and you'll not let me in. Now then, Your Honour, dear, I'll go down on the two knees of me if you like, and I'll tell you the honest truth I can't pay. Mrs. Flanagan! Mrs. What are Flanagan, you... this or Mrs. Flanagan, that you can blam down or me till you're blue in the face, but it's not myself I have in mind. It's my Patsy. It's the heart and soul out of my body, and I'm telling you no lie. Sure, if he goes, I go too. Up to heaven among the blessed saints, and it'll be all your fault. Mrs. Flanagan, will you listen you, to me? Provost, I hey. am not the provost. Oh, but it's a queer thing to see the pair of you sitting there having your tea and you not the brothers. Mrs Flanagan, you really mustn't say things like that. Oh, oh, ma'am, oh, oh, there's no offence. But he might have told me not let me go on blathering like an old parakeet itself. My husband has a committee meeting. Ah, the poor soul. Perhaps you wouldn't mind waiting for him in the morning room. You'll find a magazine in the morning room if you care to look at it. Oh, thank you, kindly. I couldn't look at a thing, not today. Oh, but you shouldn't get so excited. Maggie, show Mrs Flanagan into the morning room. OK, ma'am. Now, don't worry, Mrs Flanagan. Nothing can possibly happen to your Patsy today. I wish I knew that. I wish I knew that. You see? Well, she thought it was funny, too. Thought what was funny? Or my having tea with you. You see, you haven't uh, quite got acclimatised to this place. What state she was in? I wonder who Patsy is. I expect it's her son who's got into trouble with the police. I do hope it's nothing serious. She doesn't seem able to pay the fine, poor thing. I wasn't very nice to her either. Do you know, this has been rather an experience for me. Oh? How? Well, we don't often see people in this part of the country warming up to their fellow creatures like that. And... Uh, I'll have to go. It's getting late. Oh, but what about the interview? Well, if I don't get back to the paper, it'll look tomorrow as if Gertrude Stein had been at it. You have a great sense of responsibility for so young a man. Damn it, I'm 28 next month. Oh, what date? Uh, The 25th. That's my birthday too. How funny. I don't know. Well, I'll, uh, I'll see you in half an hour. It's a darn good date. Splendid. What splendid, dear? Oh, I'm sorry. Hello, Elizabeth. How nice. Have you met Mr. Burden? Oh, how stupid of me. Of course you have. Have I? I don't think so. Oh, that's funny. He's on your husband's paper. How interesting. You can't expect the colonel's lady to know the sanitary man's mate. I've seen you often enough, Mrs. Skirving. Have you? Well, it was darling of you to keep me company. You're certain to catch Willie when he comes back. Well, I'll see you later, Mrs. Thompson. Thanks for the tea. Uh, Goodbye, Mrs. Skirving. You are not at your most charming today, Elizabeth. Oh, nonsense, Vicky. If you encourage these reporters, there's no saying where they'll stop. Have some tea? No, thanks. Besides, Horace told me not to let them get too darn familiar. Horace seems to think a lot of this one. How? Who? Giving him this interview to do. Victoria! What's this? You don't mean to say you gave that man tea? Why, yes. Darling! The sooner you realise it, the better. You are the wife of the provost of Bakey. So far as I know, yes. What's that got to do with it? You're in Bakey now. And you mustn't think of yourself and doing what you like anymore. You must think of Willie. (laughs) Oh, I know. Willie's a really big man. Oh, don't blush, my sweet. I know you're madly in love with him. Everybody is. I don't think that's a very nice way to talk about Willie. And besides, it isn't true. Willie's always been a sort of big brother to us, and of course we admire him frightfully. As you say, everybody does. I know. He's a fashionable cut. I don't know what you mean. He's a 1937 model. He'll look ridiculous in 1940, but he's just right for the year. I think you're the most incredible, fantastic... (laughs) Hello, Elizabeth. Having a gossip with Vicky? How it was nice of you to drop in and keep her company. Hello, darling. Wearying for me? Gosh, I needed her company. I thought you'd never come home. Ah, these committee meetings go on and on and on and on. Shall I make some fresh tea? 
This hasn't been ready long. No, no, thank you. I don't think I want any tea. Uh, has the newspaper man been yet? Yes. He'll be back shortly. Ah, oh, these are horrors. He'd tell you he was giving me a front-page splash, Lizzie. He needn't have, but it was decent of him. He thought it would help if people had it rubbed into them exactly where you stood before the meeting tomorrow mm. night. Uh, whom is he sending? A very smart, capable young fellow, I thought. No, it doesn't much matter who they send. <laughs> That's what I was telling her. Oh, oh, having a row, you two? A row? All in wrestling with the gloves off. Oh, rot. Besides, they never wear gloves. Willie, I wish you'd tell Lisbeth you're unworthy of her love. She'll make me hate her if she goes on like this. Oh, don't be so damn silly. Oh, I know her of old, Willie. Of course she does. We wear the old school undies, don't we, sweetie? You'll bring Horace round after the meeting tomorrow, won't you? I'd love to. And now I really must run. Well, must you go? I'm late already. Well, look after yourself and thank Horace for me. I will. Uh-huh. I say, Victoria, a little fun between ourselves is all very well. I understand it. But Lisbeth's rather a sensitive sort of girl. She is, isn't she? I like her so much. She's not terribly interesting, but nobody is in Bakey. Oh, except you, dear, and I never see you. I don't know what it's going to be like when you're in the House of Commons. I'd hardly say we never see each other, would you? But it is pretty maddening, Vicky, to have to fight an election and keep going at this infernal bumbledom at one at the same time. Here am I sitting in a chair for two solid hours while a lot of old women wrangle as to whether the stoker at the municipal laundry is worth another tuppence a week or not, considering that his good lady has just given him a third pair of twins, one boy and one girl, and, thank the Lord, not to like their father. Are they doing well? Are who doing well? The wife and her twins. I don't know. I wasn't talking about that. Yes, but surely it's important. What are his wages? I mean, three pairs of twins, that makes six, and then you... My got... darling Victoria, I only instance the stoker as an example of the dreary sort of trifle that is occupying my not altogether valueless time. It's pretty hard work, isn't it? My point is that it isn't work at all. What? Stoking furnaces? Darling, do leave the stoker alone for a moment. You're like everybody else. They go fiddling and sentimentalising about over this hard case and that hard case, and they've lost the capacity for looking at things as a totality. The totality is what counts. Not the cheese mites. The whole cheese. In the founding of the world state, the individual has got to suffer. I suppose you'll tell them that at the meeting tomorrow. Well, perhaps that would be a little tactless. You can't tell public meetings things like that. They wouldn't understand. Even you hardly understand me. Oh, I think I do. Um, by the way, Willie, while we're on the subject, would you mind dreadfully if I stayed at home tomorrow night? You don't want to hear my speech. But I've heard it already. Oh. oh, if it would bore you. I'm not thinking of myself, Willie. I'm thinking of you. You know we've had two dress rehearsals of this speech. Well, you said yourself you thought we'd better. You're absolutely word perfect. I should hope so, but this time. Surely you couldn't bear to think that I was watching it all for the third time. I don't see why. Wouldn't you be a little embarrassed? Oh, huh. I don't know. Are you annoyed at what I said? Oh, my dear, annoyed. You are a bit, aren't you? Well, no, a little surprised, perhaps. Vicky, I've been conscious for a while that you have... Oh, quite nicely, I mean, that you've been... Well, criticising me. Well, that's one of the reasons for getting married, isn't it? So that two grown-up people can criticise each other and keep each other straight. That's how they help each other. Possibly, but you've been helping me quite a good deal lately, Vicky. Oh, well, of course, if you want a wife like Lisbeth who thinks you're a gosh-darn archangel... No, 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 you're wrong about Lizzie. I've heard her pull up Horace pretty sharply now and again. Oh, Horace. What do you mean, oh, Horace? Now, look here, Vicky, I don't mind telling you, I think your jokes about Lizzie are in damn bad taste. Willie, don't get excited about a harmless imbecile's ditherings. Mm. Or aren't you excited? Of course I'm not excited. (laughs) Oh, but when a poor, broken chief magistrate comes back from a drivelling committee meeting with his head buzzing with thousands of... Oh, oh, that reminds me, what a... Fool I am. There's someone waiting for you, William. Who is it? Um, uh, a Mrs. Flanagan. Flanagan? It was a funny name. Never heard of her. She came in in an awful state while I was having tea with the newspaper man. What's that? Having tea with the... <sighs> what did she want? It's rather funny. She took the newspaper man for you. Oh, she did, <laughs> did she? It's intolerable. I've no privacy at all. They follow me with their stupid bits of petty business to my very fireside. It was about her son. He's in some sort of trouble. What sort of trouble? With the police, I think. I don't think she can pay his fine or his bail or something. Oh, and what the blazes am I expected to do about it? Really, Victoria? I'm not quite sure what it exactly is. 
I'd better bring her in. No, 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 no. Let her wait. If she's still in a state, as you call it, it'll do her good. Oh, and by the way, that parlour maid, eh, what's her name? Um, um, Maggie. Maggie. She's quite hopeless. They always are, dear. We want someone who at least will know who has got to be let in and who had better stay outside. I'm going to get a butler. A butler? But you're practically a teetotal, dear. Well, I can't stand that half wit a day longer. A house like this needs a manservant. There's a man to see you, Mr. Thompson. <laughs> Here's your butler. He has been quick. Nonsense, it's a town clerk. Uh, send him up. <laughs> right all. Uh, right, right all. Hmm? There you are. Quite hopeless. Oh, McKellar was to bring round some papers for me to sign. I simply couldn't wait for him. The atmosphere of that infernal town hall. It's the central heating, dear. It is not the central heating, it's the blasted town council. <laughs> Ah, come in, McKellar. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Thompson. I trust to see you well. Yes, thank you, Mr. McKellar. Well, I'd better leave you two together. Well, Provost, here's quite a bundle for you, as the saying is. And what saying is? Here, give it to me. Uh, well, sir, there's not an awful lot, as you might say. Here's um, tender for supplying new stair carpet to the... Um, Municipal buildings. You'll have mind the old ones are more than a wee thing tashed, and the worst department. Give me of... all the papers. Oh, and here's all this about the three pound three shillings for the dog. What dog? Oh, you'll have mind of it, sir. The dog license that was in her ears. Oh, oh, good heavens, yes. Isn't that settled yet? It's been up in the council five times. Oh, that's right. <laughs> the area is standing so long, it's not a matter now for the small debt court. It'll have to come before the sheriff. Oh, it'll cost a bonny pickle before they're by me. What a fuss about a dog. Uh -huh. I think they might have stretched a point for once. I feel kind of funny with the wee brute. Why do you feel funny? Well, uh, you'll recall they impounded the dog by order of the Inland Revenue Authorities, and the police sergeant's bull terrier bet she'll not allow another dog within a mile of the station. So I had, in a way, as you might say... To take him into custody myself? Mm. Oh, nice, kind of wee bit mongrel, too. <laughs> you hod him out a piece of biscuit and you say, ask for it, and he goes bow bow. <clears throat> I'm sorry you've had all that trouble. As it stands now, we can't have him destroyed. Nah, yet. but it uh, makes a kind of a condemned cell sort of atmosphere about my lodgings. Poor wee soul, sitting there looking at me and can he help himself? But his owner can help it. Here, what the devil are we wasting time about? Let us go on. Eh, uh, that's to six pairs of bathing drawers for the instructors at the swimming pool. Mm. That's for a, a new 500-foot hose for the fire brigade. Oh, and, and have a blue one over here. Oh, this is me. Uh, wait out till my hair was torn and as white as a sheet, and I'll not wait a moment longer. Who are you? Honoria Gagan, or Flanagan. Her ladyship would tell you I was here. You can't come busting into my room like that. No, nor I can't, nothing else. I can't sit there with my hands folded like patients on a document. I've got to do what I've got to do. Well, go home and do it then, and don't bother me. This is a private house. Private or not, I'm here, and I'll stay here. <coughs> oh, Oh, it's yourself, Mr. McKellar. I didn't see you there. Do you know this woman? Ah, uh, right enough, I know her. And how do you find yourself, Mr. McKellar? Oh, not so bad, thank you, Honoria. Now, the provost and me has work to do. I'll see you at my office. Uh, Mr. McKellar, do you know what's happened to me? <laughs> well, I can imagine. No, and you cannot imagine. If you knew my patsy, you wouldn't have a grin the like of that from east to west all over your face. Well, in a way of speaking, I, I know him all right. He, he's lodging with me. With you? Where? In my lodgings at the town hall. At the town hall? Now, Honoria, just calm yourself, as the saying is, and it'll be all right. It's the truth you're telling me. And is he not the fine little fellow? Oh, he is that, Honoria. Mr. McKellar, have you gone completely daft? I am waiting for this lady to get out. And you're keeping my Patsy Tilly. Till, 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 till the... Now, now, till, till you, the... You, now you can't go on oh, that oh, gate, Honoria. He's only a wee oh, bit mongrel dog oh, after oh, all. Oh, mongrel, she... is it? That's what I'm telling you. He's humaner than the most of them that parade the length and breadth of the wide earth. And he's a better man than you, Mr. Prother, your honour, I'm oh, telling that's, that's, you. That's, that's no way to speak to the proverbs. Now, look here, both of you. Oh, am I interrupting? Um, Willie, this is Mr. Burden from the newspaper. 
He dashed back as soon as he could. Ah, uh, oh, uh, uh, ah, yes, yes, all right. Uh, uh, will you excuse me? I'm in the middle of a, uh, a little business. Oh, don't uh, bother about me. I can wait for hours now. Uh, it won't take a minute. Is it all right about your little boy? My little... I'm sure he couldn't have done much damage. Oh, he never done no damage, not ever in his blessed life. Growing boys can be very difficult, I know. Perhaps if I talk to him... If you talk to him, he'll bark at you. Bark at me? You see, Mammy doesn't know you. We've got it all wrong, Mrs Thompson. Patsy's a dog. Ah, oh, that's right, sir. But why did you tell me he was your son? No, I ask you, did I ever tell you anything of the kind? Oh, not but what is like a son to me. And now they're going to kill him. Oh, what rot. Who's going to kill a little dog? The corporation and the polis and the provost there. You ask Mr. McKenna. No, don't ask me anything. I have nothing to do with it. I thought you were my friend. I asked you to stand up for me and you just go wibble wobble. I'm nothing of the sort, just go wibble wobble. You look after your own affairs and leave me to mind mine. Will you be wanting me, sir? No, oh, Lord, no, 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 you can go. And a lot of use you've been. <laughs> Thank you, Provost. Uh, stick it, Honoria. You've got them, see? <laughs> stick it. Uh, good evening to you, Mrs. Thompson. Uh, good evening, Mr. McKellar. And now, perhaps, Mrs. Uh, Flanagan... There's no perhaps about it. It's a matter of life and death. You won't get me out of here till that's a set right. Perhaps I'd better wait downstairs. No, not a bit. In fact, you ought to be here. I want you to see the sort of ridiculous nonsense I have to put up with. It isn't ridiculous to her. It's like a son to me. That is not the point. Who would know what the point is better nor me? Is my dog, isn't he? It was me that couldn't pay the licence money, see? It was me you took him from, wasn't it? It's all me, isn't it? I know the point, all right, all right. Now, look here, Mrs Flanagan. If we made an exception in your case, there'd be no end to the business. If we let everybody off, we'd never collect any dog licences at all. I'm not everybody. Everybody can pee. I can't. But why not? Because it's more than I can afford. It's far too much. I'm afraid you'll have to leave the government to decide whether it's too much or not. In the meantime, you're two whole years behind the more. The government took away my wee shop. It was not the government. It was the corporation. Your shop was a perfect eyesore. And besides, you've got your barrel. Oh, so I have. And it's as much use to me as an ice cream bar at the North Pole in the dead of winter. That will do. <laughs> I'm sorry to keep you waiting over a thing like this, Mr. Uh, uh, um. Burden. Willie, how much does she owe? Uh, two or three pounds, I think, with costs. And now... dis donc. Oh. On va payer la petite sombrelle. Faut bien lui rendre le chien. Uh, uh, mais non, mais non. Uh, il ne s'agit pas de trois livres... Il s'agit d'un principe. Il ne s'agit jamais d'un principe. Toujours d'un homme. Here, here. Oh, here, here, eh? Then I'll tell you, Mr. A, um, uh, Burden, how things stand. The tax on dogs is one of the few government impositions in which I heartily concur. This town, under the powers given it by the Municipal Rating Act, is enabled to collect additional rates from dog owners. Is it? I mean, can it do that? Uh, you will allow me, perhaps, to know more about the rating act than you do. The dogs in this town are a perfect pest. In a working-class area, you can't walk two steps without tumbling over a, a, a knot of mongrels. If they're so fond of the dogs, why don't they keep them in order, for goodness sake? When we put on the rates, hundreds of people shut the doors and let the brutes stray. I didn't, mister, and you know it. Uh, you were warned again and again. If you're so keen, you'll just have to save up this summer and buy a new dog. Oh, come and along, you... Mrs. Flanagan. We'll see what can be done about it. On, on, on you, dog. Well, Provost, I'd like to subscribe. Subscribe to what? Well, a reporter on a provincial paper hasn't much, but I have a notion I'd like to. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, oh well, if you want to do it yourself, on the if quiet... If you mean that you think I'm going to pay that woman's tax and rates and costs... I may tell you that I haven't the least intention of doing so. Besides, it's too late. The bench of magistrates have decided that the dog is to be destroyed. <sighs> now we'll talk about business. You're sure the interview will be in time for tomorrow's issue? Oh, yes. They've kept a couple of columns for it. Very good. Now, will you start or shall I? Well, sir, you know pretty well what line you're going to take. Very well. We'll start like this. Hmm. <coughs> Uh, during my comparatively short term of office as provost of this borough, I have kept certain fixed principles before me. 
It is for the rate to judge whether I have translated them into practice. My object has been to promote and ensure the physical, moral, and financial well-being of every single member of the community without respect of social position or... Aren't you taking notes? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Thompson. I don't know why. I was thinking about that woman. What woman? The woman with the dog. Perhaps if you could have the goodness to leave the consideration of the canine species to another more fitting occasion and concentrate your mind on what I am saying... Well, I mean, couldn't you... I mean, there are ways of doing these things. I beg your pardon? Provost, don't you think it would be better to settle this case? Oh, for heaven's sake, it is a matter of no importance whatever. How can I give my mind to really urgent things when the very reporter who comes round to interview me goes all sentimental about nothing? But is it just sentiment? Is it nothing? You know, a very little thing can swing an election. I know that. Now let's get on. It looks like cheek, but I felt I had to warn you. Yes, 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 yes. Very nice of you. Now, where was I? Oh, and, and by the way... Yes, Provost. In case I forget, I want a proof of this. Of the interview? Yes. What did you think I wanted? Mrs. Thompson and I are going to the cattle show at Croy tomorrow. And we won't be back till just before the meeting. right oh. Mm. Doesn't matter how late I get the proof. It's not that I think you won't do it very well, but you quite understand, don't you? I'm making an early start and I won't see a copy of the advertiser. I'll send a galley slip round before 11 tonight. Good. Don't forget... Now, where was I? Huh? Ah, yes. <clears throat> uh, I'm asking my friends in Becky to give me an opportunity of applying these principles in a larger field. The fundamental yeah, unit in any conception of nationalism is the individual... Or the it's that blasted woman again. This is too much. Just a minute. What's going on here? I thought I told you to leave my house. Oh, stop that and get out. Go on, get out. Ah, damned impudence. Irish tinker. Ah, so much for that. Uh, where was I? Ah, oh, oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Start uh, with the individual uh, before we can realize what nationalism really means. To our leader, even the least of these, his brethren. Did it say? Yet think he knew the wee fella. Beautiful it was. Uh, whatsoever you do unto the least of these, my brethren, you do it unto me. <laughs> and he says that's not confined to them that walks on two legs. And there's a bit about me. <laughs> and, and I bet where it says that a man that does the kind of thing that the provost done isn't fit to be the provost, let alone go to London to help the king to rule the land. How lovely. Oh, it's lovely, sure enough. But it'll be a fine surprise to me if the provost will be seeing the beauty of it. It would surprise me, too. And you'll have the fiery rage of a mountain. May we pass it or I know it. Have you got the paper with you? I haven't seen one today. Oh, I I have indeed. I have indeed. Now, let me see where I put it. There we are. That's the very thing, ma'am. Heavens! Who wrote this? Oh, it's... It's all covered with blood or something down here where the name ought to be. Oh, no, it's tomato sauce, do you see? My hands were trembling terrible and me sitting reading it, do you see? I see. No, I... I can't make out who wrote it. Give what you can and give quickly, not only for the poor woman's sake, but to show our local bumbles what they're up against. Anything from tuppence to a tenner will be gratefully received by the undersigned at this office. Do you think, no, the provost will be annoyed at the lake of the house? I shouldn't be a bit surprised. Victoria! Oh, hello, Lizzie. Is the meeting over already? No. Yes, it will be soon. Well, uh, Mrs Flanagan, I think... Uh, thank you kindly, ma'am. I'll not be disturbing you a moment longer. I'll let you know. Ah, oh, the blessed saints put in a word for you, ma'am. And good evening to you too, ma'am. Victoria! What in heaven's name? I mean, what's she doing here? Do you know her? How do you call her Mrs Flanagan? It's all across the headlines in our paper. Yes, this is incredible, isn't it? Incredible, it's unbelievable. It's loathsome. But I say, Victoria, it's not my fault. You don't think Willie will think I had anything to do with it, Victoria. Honest to goodness, if I've told Harry once, I've told him a thousand times, you can't trust these young devils. Who wrote it? Not Frank Burke. Oh, of course 
it was. The dirty little impudent half daft bullshit that he is. Is Horace back from Birmingham? Does he know? I should damn well think he does. And the people at the meeting, do they know? Yes, they knew it. The beasts. I don't understand. Well, he saw the proofs last night. He said it was quite brilliant. He looked very pleased. What a filthy trick. Horace is back no sooner turns than this sort of thing happens. Horace is mad with rage. Did he tell Willie before the meeting? I wouldn't let him. It's the most damnable, blackguardly, filthy... Darling, darling, I shouldn't get so excited. The whole thing's rather ludicrous if you look at it properly. It's ludicrous? And... Is it? Oh, damn funny, I don't think... I mean the people here know Willie. They respect him. Respect and... him? Do you know what happened tonight? No. Was there a row? It's ruin, I tell you. It's ruin. Oh, nonsense. Didn't his speech get over? It was a good speech. Of course it was. But nobody heard it. They didn't let him speak. Oh, why didn't you tell me I must go to him? No, it's no use. He's gone off with the election committee to talk things over. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Well, what happened? Tell me. There isn't much to tell. They were passing the advertiser around the hall, reading it and sniggering. That all read this. He had only to say a word to put her mind at rest. But that would have been beneath the dignity of our worthy provost. It wasn't beneath his dignity to kick her downstairs. Tonight you will hear this dull bully making a great parade of his humanitarian principles. They are not good enough for us, and neither is he. Neither is he! In large caps! In our paper! Yes, yes, but what happened? Well... He hadn't read this muck, and Horace was frightened to tell him. So he got up to speak. <laughs> oh, pull yourself together, do you hear? <laughs> pull yourself together with a cat calls? No. Dog calls. Dog calls? What do you mean? They began to bark. Bark? Yes, bark. They let him talk for about two minutes. All about the unemployed and the big relief scheme. And then there was a funny sound, like a wee dog yelping in his sleep. Then some roughs at the back took it up. Then the whole audience, yelping and growling and howling and barking and me. What did he do? What did who do? Will, how did he take it? I don't think you need ask. He behaved splendidly. He just stood there like, like Julius Caesar or somebody. That old fool of a chairman ringing his bell like a madman. And then he sat down and folded his arms. And then they let Lord Scaravier speak. You could have heard the pin drop. But the minute he talked about the article and its being a silly, vulgar misunderstanding and a fuss about nothing, pandemonium started again. They were like wild beasts. It was horrible. I, I couldn't stand it. I came away. Oh, what a shame. Oh, well, I couldn't bear it, honestly. Oh, no, no, I don't mean you. I mean... I mean, it's such bad luck for Will. Oh, it's not only bad luck. His career. I don't know what'll happen to him. Oh, he'll straighten it out all right. You but can't I just... straighten out a mess like that. They've been too clever. Oh, the young blackguard. Prison's too good for him, though he'll go there all right. What for? How can you stand there and ask me what for? Have you no heart? This is the most... Terrible thing that's ever happened to me, and you what stand there like. What happened to you? He isn't your husband. Oh, you don't appreciate him. That's what you don't. And you do. Oh, yes, I suppose you do. What do you mean? Oh, damn it, Lisbeth! You come here. And... Yes, Maggie. Please, ma'am. Well, you see that young gent that was here yesterday. What young gent? Him that was here from the paper. Oh, that's impossible. You're making a mistake. No, I'm not. It's him, all right. Did he give his name? No, Mum. Well, t tell him to go away. Tell him he can't come in. But he isn't. Of all the impertinence. Oh. Go away. I can't bear the sight of you. I want to see Mr Thompson. He isn't here. You know quite well he isn't here. I thought the meeting was over. Weren't you there? No. Victoria, you must not speak to that man. What do you want? I want to give him an explanation. You mean an apology? No, an explanation. Victoria, I cannot and will not stand this. You are encouraging him. Oh, you... Lisbeth, we must be sensible. You can, if you like. I'm going. I'll come back when the others come. Oh, very well. Well? I think I'd better wait downstairs. I think you'd better. Uh, no. 
Oh, wait a minute. No, I'd better go. It can't be very pleasant for you to uh, to see me. I'll call at the office tomorrow. You'd better wait now you're here. I suppose you know what you've done. I hope you realise the mischief you've caused. You'll have rather a job putting it right, won't you? What harm has my husband ever done to you? Why do you stab in the back like this? It's hard to explain. What have you to say in your defence? Well? I don't want to defend myself. You have slandered and hurt a good, fine, honourable man. Doesn't that need some kind of defence? Not even an explanation? I didn't think you would need an explanation. Oh. You thought I'd congratulate you, did you? You thought your damnable, irresponsible schoolboy impudence would send me into the seventh heaven of wonder and admiration, did you? No, but I thought you'd understand. Understand what? You don't mean to tell me that that idiotic story about the dog has led you... You think to... the story was idiotic? Well, I... I think there's been a little official clumsiness and stupidity. But it was a very small thing in proportion to the bitterness of your attack. Oppression is never a very small thing. You are really very, very young. Oh, youth has nothing to do with it. You're younger than I am, and you... Well, you're prepared to lie down to a thing like that. Oh, indeed. You want me to support you, do you? I don't need any support. You don't, do you? Have you considered the probable consequences of all this? Oh, don't stand there glowering at me. I mean the consequences for you. I don't give a damn for them. You are committing suicide. You're chucking your whole career over the hedge... You'll lose your job and your livelihood. Oh, I suppose so, yes. Do you really think it's worth it? Of course it was worth it. Oh, Mr Burton, don't exaggerate. This is about a dog, don't you see? A little mongrel dog that got tangled in red tape. What should my husband have done? What would Lenin or Trotsky or whoever your hero is have done? The woman had been warned over and over again. It's so easy to be sentimental and not... You consider- aren't sentimental. No, I'm not. Oh, but you've had a talk with Mrs Flanagan tonight. Oh, of course. I tried to get her dog back for her. I did my best. You to- did your best in a woman's way, but... And what's a man's way? Well, to hit out. And if he smashes up everything and gets squashed himself? Well, all the more reason for hitting out. It shows you've no personal motive. Oh, don't try and put that stuff over on me. You did this because you hated my husband. No, I didn't. I had nothing against him. Quite the contrary. Oh, don't be such a mule. I'm trying to help you. It's probably none of my business, but I did think... Especially as I seem to be the only being who has taken the trouble to size you up. You sized me up? In my simple, artless way. You're quite an interesting young man. You find me interesting? Oh, Intensely. Oh, when I met you for the first time yesterday, I hoped you might. Yesterday was a very big day in my life. You can't have had a very exciting life. What do you do with it? Your life, I mean. Oh, I just go about stabbing people in the back. Oh, to be an ass. I want to know about you. You've done something very extraordinary. What made you do it? Was it vanity or exhibitionism or, or just advertisement? What sort of man are you? Have you ever met a decent sort of chap who could tell you right off the reel what sort of a decent chap he is? I'm like this or like that. I've got such and such qualities and such and such motives. I've never met a man who made the mischief you did without rhyme or reason. Well... For an animal? A dog? A mongrel dog? It's very difficult. Go on. Go on. All right, then. When I was a boy, we used to live in a house at the foot of a very steep hill. They were building a house on the top of the hill, and every day carts used to go up with heavy loads of stone. A lot of them were too heavy for the horses. Often they stuck. Then the carters hit them. On the flanks, on their bellies, on their nostrils and eyes. And the horses gave an extra heave and staggered on up the hill. I stood and looked at them, day after day, for months. One day, when I was fourteen, I just couldn't stick it. I went up to a carter. Oh, he just put the flat of his hand against my face and gave me a shove. I went spinning into the gutter. Well, I said to myself, wait till you've grown up. 
You're afraid now, but you won't be afraid then. Every time you see anything cruel, you won't stop to consider or think of your skin. You'll hit out. You've done that? The best way I could. You've never been afraid? Often. My first impulse is always, go on. My second is, ah, after all, it's none of my business. But I found that if I chose the second, I went through hell for it afterwards. And you never choose the second way? Never? No, I don't know. There might be times. But when it's only the matter of a job, well, it's a big world. There are always places to go. But the world isn't full of jobs. What'll become of you? Oh, I'll be free at any rate. If you do things like this, you'll find yourself in jail someday. You won't be free then. I'll get out again. Look, when you find that you've been wrong, that you've hit the wrong carter, that the man you were aiming at wasn't the sort of man you thought no, no, of... No, 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 I'm not going oh. to make any statement tonight. Hush. That's quite final. He's here. Um, go in there. Well, you must wait for a bit. He mustn't see you yet. Yes, but that's hiding. I can't do that. Will you please try for once not to be childish? I've got to prepare him. Oh, all right. But only to please you. Yes, to please me. <clears throat> Will! Have you heard the news? Oh, yes, darling. Elizabeth's just gone. I'm so terribly sorry I wasn't with you. <sighs> Doesn't matter now. Where is Mr. Skirving? He's gone to fetch Elizabeth. He'll be here presently. Oh, he's done me a fine service, Skirving. Sending that individual to my house. Oh, dearest, don't be so down about it. Things will look different tomorrow. You don't know what you're talking about. But, Willie, darling, a silly newspaper article can't make any difference to a man like you. I can't afford, and the party can't afford, to have every little brute of a schoolboy barking at me at every street corner. I'm down, Vicky. I'm done for. That scoundrel has earned his pay only too well. His pay? Of course he was paid to do it. How do you know? It's quite obvious. I know perfectly well who's behind it, too. They know the people of this country, a nation of dog fanciers. They'll neglect their children and sit up all night with a sick whippet, with tears running down their fat faces. Oh, I wonder what they paid our smart friend. Willie, I'm certain you're making a mistake. Well. He'll catch it all right anyhow. Oh, darling, isn't that a little vindictive? Wouldn't it be better to come to some arrangement? Uh, that was Skirving's idea, but I said thank you for nothing. What good would a withdrawal and apology do me now? The damage is done. I hate saying I told you so, but well, perhaps if you'd listened to me, paid the fine for Mrs Flanagan... They'd have found some other way of getting at me. Can't you see? It's got nothing to do with a blasted dog. Oh, for God's sake, don't be so stupid. All the same. What do you mean, all the same? Burden did try to make you change your mind, didn't he? Victoria, that was all a fake. Uh, you don't understand politics. There's nothing, literally nothing, they won't stoop to. Suppose it wasn't a fake. Suppose he felt so strongly about it that your refusal drove him to write the article. Just hot and in a rage. Darling, I think you'd better see Dr. McCluskey tomorrow. Well, here we are. I thought we'd never get in. Never get in? Why? I never saw such a crowd down there in the terrace. Well, where? Why, Joe, so they are. Oh, they're very quiet. Just curiosity, I should think. Well, Victoria, I can't tell you how sorry I am. It's a desperate business. It just shows you. Oh, do you know what Victoria says? She says he's an idealist. That he's ruined me and your paper and the party and the country because he was sorry for the poor woman and a poor wee dog. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, has he been trying to get it? But while I was facing that infernal riot in the town hall, you were sitting quietly here, by my fireside, talking to that blackguard. I am. He came to explain. To you? No, to you. But he came too early. And I don't think he's a blackguard, otherwise I shouldn't have spoken you to him. You don't think he's a blackguard? Oh, uh, perhaps I ought to explain that Victoria firmly believes that everything is done for the best of motives in this best of all possible worlds. Oh, adding a nice sum to his bank balance is a pretty good motive. I am compelled to say, Victoria, you have rather curious ideas of the kind of company a young married woman should choose for her ease. Oh, but Willie... Some of these people are so quaint and interesting. Ah. And if Victoria likes to study people like Mr. Burden and Mrs. Flanagan... Who is Mrs. Flanagan? You know, the dog woman. Has she been here too? Oh, yes. Mr. Burden, Mrs. Flanagan and Mrs. Thompson, a charming alliance. A touching display of loyalty. Uh, that's not fair. You've no right to speak to me like no, that. No, 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 no. You mustn't mind what Willie says. He's had a trying time. A trying time. 
What did young Burden have to say for himself? Ask him yourself. No. Oh, but honestly, I really want to know. You do, do you? Well, is he acting the loony or high and mighty or what? Oh, that's it. I mean, Victoria, I really must know. You'll know soon enough. He's here. Here? Uh, what do you mean? Where? In there. Vicky! I think you are being funny and damned bad taste. You haven't hidden him. Yes, I have. I wanted to get you to see things reasonably, but... Oh, what's the use? My God, this is the limit! The streets full of people. Never mind her. You must show yourself. No, I'll deal with this gentleman first. Good evening. To what am I indebted for the honour of this clandestine visit? Well, in all my life, I never saw the like of that. It's an outrage. You have the monstrous impertinence. Oh, there's no impertinence about it. I attacked you for all I was fit, and you're entitled to an explanation. Explanation? As one gentleman to another, I suppose, you damned, snivelling little thug. Willie, do behave yourself. Behave myself? Do you want me to offer him a drink? I think it would be a very good idea. Uh, well, I don't. There are limits to what a decent man will stand. You see, Mrs. Thompson? Don't you dare address your master, my wife, sir. Well, damn it, sir, you won't listen to me. Uh, no wonder. Oh, Thompson, I'll see that this is set right. I swear I will. Oh, you dirty, treacherous, cowardly little rat. Oh, that'll do. I'd better go. Stay where you are. What for? No, no, no. Don't let's get excited and all head up. Now, Burden, now listen to me. I admit I wasn't on the spot, but why didn't you consult Mr. Smith? He wouldn't have let me print it. Well, of course he wouldn't. But the point is it was absolutely unauthorised. Absolutely unauthorised. Authority or no authority, I had to do it. Oh, had to do it? Had to do it? What do you mean by you had to do it? You know jolly well why. Oh, well, I insist on hearing why. I insist. Because Mr. Thompson behaved in a small matter like a fiend. <laughs> I wanted to make pretty sure he wouldn't have the chance to behave like that in a bigger one. Oh, I see. And you presume to judge Mr. Thompson on behalf of... On behalf of humanity in general, eh? Yes, if you put oh. it that way. Oh. For humanity in general, I see. <laughs> And how much did you get from humanity in general for all this? I beg your pardon? It is a perfectly simple question. What did they pay you for this? Come, come, Burton. We all know who's at the bottom of it. Uh, what did you get? Cash down or a fat job? Oh, you can bet your boots it was cash down. What sort of a job would they give him? What's he fit for? Backing horses? I back horses, all right. Against their masters. Uh, a dirty little paid hack. No, no. A stinking gangster's toast. Oh, shut up. What's that you said? I said, shut up. If you want a slanging match, I'll give you all you want. Somewhere else. Tomorrow. You won't leave this house till you've written a letter recanting every single word you've written. That's right, recant. Every word of it. Come along now, Burden, make the best of it. Here's a pen and paper. Take down to my dictation. Do you hear me speaking to you? What do you want me to recant? Your article! I'll tell you exactly what to say and we'll have it in the morning papers. No. What do you mean by no? I mean I won't. You won't what? I won't sign anything. I won't withdraw anything. I won't. You won't? No, I damned well won't. But why not? Because every word of what I wrote is true. So, you refuse? I was trying to convey that impression. Oh, you... Half a minute, Mr. Thompson. See here. You know what this lets you in for? Oh, yes. Very well, sir. <laughs> Very well. Consider yourself sacked. See? Oh, right, oh. I thought I was sacked anyway. And I suppose you know it means an action for slander. Oh, yes, if you like. And not only civil action, sir, but criminal proceedings. And ten years penal servitude and twenty strokes of the cat three times a day after food. Go on, go on. Well, I must get out of this. I can't bear it any longer. You will have the goodness to stay where you are. You desert me in a moment like this when my whole career is at stake. Well, what the devil do you expect me to do about it? I see. Oh, oh, oh. this evening is teaching me a good many things I didn't know before. It's teaching me, too. Now, now, now look here, Skerving. Wait a minute. Oh, it's all right. It's a counter-demonstration. A counter-demonstration? Well, here's a... I see Willie McFarlane and Jock Smith the baker and we sure to see the publican. Ah, they're all our men. Ah, it's all right. <laughs> They've come to give you a cheer. You think so? Of course. Go out and speak to them. That's right. Just step out and say a few words, sharp and to the point, and we'll splash them in tomorrow's edition. And that'll put everything all right. And I think 
Young sir, you'll find that all you've made is a storm in a bucket and got through it in the process. Come on, Thompson. Oh, well, if you, if you think this... Oh, Will, do you think you'd better? Uh, most certainly. But we don't know. They may be here to make trouble. Oh, my God, I wouldn't be surprised. There's no more decency or loyalty in the world. Don't, Will. Don't go out. Don't listen to her. She's afraid. Go. Very well. And gentlemen, I hardly know how to thank you for the generous impulse that led you at this hour to come to me to express your loyalty and your disapprobation of the scandalous proceedings. Uh, uh, shameful proceedings. <laughs> All this. Oh, what does it matter now? This evening is teaching me a good many things. Yes, see here, Thompson, I'd like to ask you something. You've no right to ask him anything. You've ruined but it. Lizzie. And you shut up too. You're as bad as the rest of them. You've never, never, never understood him. Well, perhaps I'd better... Perhaps you had better, by God. Well, seems as if I was superfluous. That's right, superfluous. No damn good to anyone. You weren't bribed, I'll say that for you. Nobody would speculate a brass farthing on a maniac like you. You stupid, fat-headed fanatic. Do you think you've got the better of me? Ah, oh, I'll show you. My God, I'll show you. You'd risk the whole future of your country in a little mongrel car, would you? Why well, you can't even save him. You've had your trouble for nothing, do you hear? You'll be destroyed tomorrow, do you hear? And a damn good riddance. And now what's the house? Oh, Mr. Provost. What is it? Oh, Mr. Provost. Oh, oh, the wee dog. And now what the hell is the matter with the wee dog? He's, he's gone, sir. They've stolen him. He's away. Mrs. Flanagan, this is a dreadful business. And in the sheriff court, too. How are you, Noria? Bearing up? Oh, don't you worry, your dear soul. I'm bearing up all right. And, oh, the kindness itself you showed to my wee Patsy. Oh, and how is the wee fellow? Oh, he's in the greatest of high spirits. Oh, you look kind of that way yourself, Honoria. Your guy spruce the day. Quite the madam. Eh, they're saying they collected enough to get you your shoppy back. And a wee bit over, they're saying... He had to put up four figures. Ah, oh, now, why not five or six while we're making a story of it? You're minding about <laughs> rainy days now. I mean, you'll not be dissipating the mercies on dressmakers and beauty parlours. Beauty's only skin deep, this oh, age. Ah, it's not even as deep as that at my age. D your age? Man, that's just the right age. I, I never had any taste for green apples myself. I'd better be getting out of this now. You're trying to put the come hither on me, you young rascal. Oh, did no, but you're a bonny kind of buxom, decent as he, and there's nae Herman telling ye. <laughs> aye, aye, you're going to have a nice, cosy dune set. And uh, what may his lordship the provost be saying to all this? Oh, whist, whist. For by, he's not the provost anymore. Did he resign now? Uh huh. He resigned. But you'll have heard. Oh, what would I be hearing and I that busy? Tell us now, Mr. McKellar, darling. Well, he's away to Paris with Mistress Skirving. Holy saints, is that not awful? And him such a noble sort of gentleman, too. Mm -hmm. <gasps> you never know. No, you never know. And did feloniously steal said dog from said lodging the property of the corporation of Baker, in that you did convey said dog to a place or places unknown. You've heard the charge. Do you understand it? I've tried to. Do you wish to hear it again? No, thank you. 
Do you plead guilty or not guilty? Not guilty, my lord. Not guilty. Mr. Procurator Fiscal? My lord, I call Joseph McKellar. Joseph McKellar! Joseph McKellar. You are Joseph McKellar, a justice of the peace and town clerk to the borough of Becky. I am. On the 25th of January this year, you accepted custody of a small black and white mongrel dog, answering to the name of Patrick, otherwise Patsy, previously the property of Honoria Flanagan. I did. Your lodging is situated in the town hall at Bakey? It is. Uh, you recognise this document? Uh, I do. Is this your signature? It is. In this, you will take over custody of the said dog on behalf of the corporation from Mr Briggs, the chief constable. That is so. On the evening of the 27th, the dog was still in your custody? It was. Uh, will you tell his lordship what precautions you had taken to keep the dog under safe custody? Uh, my lord, as a precaution against possible depredations, I had put him in a box. Uh, was the box locked? Uh, no, sir. What? I, uh... I find in your precognition that you said it was locked. Yes, sir. So uh, the dog could have walked out by itself? Uh, it, it could, my lord. McKellar, you are on your own. I know. That's why I'm telling you the truth now. What did you mean by lying before, then? Well, sir, you see, Mr. Thompson might have got to know of it, and he was a gay, hot-tempered, and spirited man, Mr. Thompson. <laughs> so, so I thought... That... You thought it didn't matter. Let me tell you, it does matter. It makes all the difference, you know, McKellar, whether the panel forced an entry or didn't. <sighs> I... I didn't right understand that, my lord. Nobody does, anyhow. Will the accused please refrain from making comments? Go on, Mr. Fiscal. Uh, be careful now, McKellar. When did you leave the town hall on the 27th? Uh, it would be half past five. Half past five. They were open then, I suppose. Well, they opened at five. I only went for a walk, anyhow. I see. I don't. What had opened at five? The public houses, my lord. Oh, I see. Go on. Uh, when did you get back to the town hall? <laughs> at half past nine. And the dog had gone. You had shut the door of your room before you left? I had. It was wide open when I came back. Had anybody seen the dog in your lodger? Yes, sir. Mr. Burton. When? Same forenoon. He brought it a poke of dog biscuits. Had the poke uh, packet of biscuits disappeared with the dog? They had. Thank you. Mr. Mingus. <clears throat> uh, my lord. Uh, now then, Mr. McKellar. It is quite easy to get into the town hall. Uh, yes, if the caretaker's in the yard. Uh, anyone might have come in and gone up to your room without being noticed. Oh, yes, sir, they could. I gather that a very large number of people were interested in the fate of the animal in question. Oh, you're right, sir. It was the clash of the tune, as you might say. It was the clash of the tune, as I might say. Uh, tell me, Mr. McKellar, you are sure you closed the door of your room before you left? Positive. Certain. Sure. I wouldn't have had any harm come to the wee man. Thank you. Uh, you were rather attached to this dog. Oh, I was, my lord. You see, sir, he's a nice wee soul. That will do. <laughs> you may sit down. Call Horace Skirving. Horace Skirving! Horace Skirving. You are Horace Skirving, proprietor and editor of the Bakey Advertiser newspaper. That is so. The panel, Francis Burden, was in your employment? Yes. I had to dispense with his services, though. Why was that? Uh, my lord, I object. I don't. Let him go on. Mr. Mingus, I think you'd better speak to your client. My lord, I am sick to death of speaking to him. Uh, leave this to me, Mr. Mingus. Go on, Mr. Skirving. He wrote a certain unauthorised article in my paper. Is that the article? That's it. 
the production number 15, my lord. It is an attack on the ex-provost, Mr. Thompson. Well, what has this got to do with it? I am establishing a motive, my lord. Oh. Oh, very well. Have you formed an opinion as to why he wrote that article? Well, he didn't want Thompson to be elected to Parliament. He was... Well, he was... Suborn. Oh, dear, dear, dear. You kindly keep your observations to yourself, Mr. Mingus. Was he suborned by an opposite political party? He was. He as good as admitted it. Mr. Fiscal, are you suggesting that the alleged theft was committed from a political motive? Yes, my lord. I am certain it was, my lord. He was out to make trouble, all the trouble he could for Thompson and yes, for all of us. Thank you, he, Mr. Skirving. Mr. Minnis? Uh, no questions, my lord. That will do, Mr. Skirving. You may stand down. <clears throat> Call Elizabeth MacJanet or Skirving. Elizabeth MacJanet or Skirving. Elizabeth MacJanet or Skirving. Hold up your right hand and say these words after me. I swear by Almighty God. Repeat that, please. I swear by Almighty God. Oh, yes. All right. I swear by Almighty God. As I shall answer to God on the great day of judgment. As I shall answer to God. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the last bit. On the great day of judgment. As I shall answer to the great day of judgment. Is that right? That I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That I will tell nothing but the whole truth, and that I will tell... Uh, go on, Mr. Fraser. I'll see that she tells the truth. <clears throat> you are Mrs. Skirving. I am, and I'm not. Mrs. Skirving, will you have the goodness to explain what in the world you mean by I am and I'm not? Well, you see... It's not very easy to explain, and I'm a little dithered. You know how it feels when you have a frantic headache coming on and it's not arrived yet, sort of. Uh, I think I can explain. There is an action for divorce pending between Mr. and Mrs. Skirving. But she is still Mrs. Skirving. Yes, my lord. Then what on earth does she mean? Wasting the time of the court chattering about matters that are absolutely irrelevant to the subject under discussion. I, 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 I sometimes wonder what we're coming to. Here we have a well-dressed woman, obviously a fairly good social position, and presumably of some education. For some reason or other, everybody's supposed to be educated nowadays. I fail to see much evidence of it myself. Or oh, what with bridge and nightclubs and jazz music. Uh, what are you laughing at, Mr. Mingus? Uh, was I laughing, my lord? You made a sort of gesture with your features that I've always taken as expressing amusement. I'm unaware of anything amusing in what I'm saying. I hardly fancy to well, my lord. Then perhaps you'll refrain from, 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 from catching till you find yourself in a more suitable place for that exercise. As your lordship pleases. Eh, but with all respect, your lordship misapprehended the exact nature of the gesture to which your lordship was pleased to refer. As a matter of fact, I was merely stifling a very insistent yawn. Indeed, Mr. Mingus. <laughs> uh, perhaps your lordship will now revise your pronouncement as to the suitable uh, locus for that exercise. If you wish me, sir, to recount the uses for which this place is suitable, I am quite prepared to do so. For one thing, it is suitable for the exercise of your undoubted talents as a defending counsel. Talents, I may remark, which I have not observed to be conspicuously employed in this particular case. Really, my lord, with the deepest respect, I am compelled to characterise the comment which has just fallen from your lordship's lips as somewhat unusual, and if I may say so, a little unfortunate. Yes, 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 Mr Mingus, but... If your it... lordship will allow me, your lordship will appreciate that I am in a position of peculiar difficulty. My client is an extremely eccentric person. Added to this, I humbly submit that your lordship's intervention between my client and myself on at least one occasion earlier in this case transformed my difficulties into impossibilities. Your lordship's opinion of my poor capabilities expressed, if I may say so, in all sincerity with a terseness and clarity that are a credit to the Scottish bar has left me with no alternative but to withdraw from the case. Good morning. Good <laughs> morning. 
<laughs> Mr. Barden, I regret that your counsel has seen fit to retire from the case. Uh, do you wish me to adjourn the court so that your agent may have an opportunity of instructing another counsel? No, no, go on. I'm enjoying it. Whether you are enjoying it or not is beside the point. Do you wish to continue the case represented by your solicitor, Mr. Cahoon, whom I am happy to see in court? No, no, I'll defend myself, if I may go to the table. Please do. And I think you should be guided by your solicitor. You couldn't be in better hands. Oh, thank you, my lord. <laughs> go on, Mr. Fiscal. <clears throat> ah. Well, uh, Mrs. Skirving, to resume... I must ask you to cast your mind back to the evening of January the 27th. Yes, Mr. Fraser? What happened on that evening? I'll tell you. Burden stole the dog. And why? Because he hated Mr. Thompson. And why did he hate him? Because he was in love with Vicky Thompson and everybody knows it. And it's a darn shame that Mr. Thompson should be hounded out of a hole like Vicky just because two rubbish Silence, people. Mrs. Sterling. How dare you? Mr. Procurator Fiscal, I, I think this is a good opportunity to make a break. The court will adjourn for lunch. <coughs> court raise. Hello. Aren't you going to shake hands? Well, I didn't uh, somehow think you'd want to. How did you get here? One's got to go to the funniest places to meet you. You wanted to meet me? Yes. <laughs> Isn't it funny how we fashionable women flock to the condemned cell? You desperados are absolutely irresistible. Do they let you sprint up and down the corridor during your trial? Uh, they're having an interval. Considering the verdict? No, lunch. <laughs> Why do you look at me like that? It may be some months before I see a nice-looking girl again. It's just the poor convict taking his last look at the splendours of nature before he enters the living tomb. Then why didn't he have a look at the splendours of nature before? The splendours of nature spent hours telephoning, but the convict was out. The splendours of nature wrote and wired oh, and... Good Lord, they must be lying at my lodgings. The splendours of nature offered themselves as a witness, but nobody took any notice. Oh, Mrs. Thompson, I hadn't a cheek Look, to... Look, Mr. Burden, you don't seem to know that... Oh, I know a lot. And I've only just heard the thing that interests me most in the whole world. That you two are going to be... Yes, we are. And Mr. Thompson has gone away. Gone away? And you two are... Yes, uh... indeed we are. Divorced? Oh, not yet. We will be. <coughs> oh, fish Patsy, you. you'll not be allowed in court. Ah, now let the wee man have his fun. Yes, what on earth is it they've got? Oh, uh, production 666. What do you mean? The cause of my downfall. Patsy. Oh, the little villain. And it's all his fault. Tell me, how are things going? They'll let you off with a small fine, won't they? Oh, a small spot of the clink, probably. They can't make up their minds about my motives. Your motives? Oh, but my angel lamb, why don't you tell them? You told me all right. Yes, I told you. Now then, come along now, time you was in. Have you got to go? Well, they can't start without me. <laughs> oh, Victoria! What is the matter with you? Well, here, of all places, in a lousy sheriff's court, that it should happen here. What should happen? Oh, listen, Frank, you've got to get out of this mess. Shall I come in and give evidence? No, no, no. Well, then promise me you'll speak up for yourself. Say you were damned if you would see a fellow creature ill-treated. Say what you said to me. Do you know what's wrong with women? No, but... They've no finer feelings. Oh, don't argue. I know I'm right. Tell the court. About the horses on the hill. About the oath you took. You propose that I should tell that to the sheriff and to the rest of that gaping monkey house? Yes, why not? You can tell that sort of thing once in a lifetime to one human being, Victoria. And then get a red face whenever you think of it. One human being? To the woman one loves. 
is your next witness, Mr. Fiscal? The veterinary surgeon, my lord. Why? Is the dog ill? Uh, no, my lord. Identification to assess the value of the animal, my lord. Oh. You'll find in Vic 2, Cap 3, Sec 10, my lord, that the evidence of an expert witness is necessary in all cases of horse stealing, cattle maiming. I know, I know. May I call Mr. Cassidy? Yes. Call Matthew Aloysius Cassidy. Matthew Aloysius Cassidy. Matthew Aloysius Cassidy. You are Matthew Aloysius Cassidy, a member of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons? That's me. You live at um, number 17, the Drygate. That's right. Uh, you see this dog? Of course I do. Uh, do you recognize him? Yes. He's Patsy, a well-known character. Hello, Patsy, me buck. <laughs> you have examined the dog? Oh, I have. What are your findings? Well, sir, he's a proper bonanza, that dog is. If you think a dog's only a dog and that's all there is to it, there's the living answer to you, sitting up there by me like patience on a monument, smiling at grief. I have never, in all my experience, beheld a specimen comprising in his own person such a variety of characteristics of so many different breeds. Now, from his rump to his shoulders, you'd say he was a sheepdog. But he has the mizzle of a setter and ears that are a wee bit reminiscent of a cocker spaniel. He's got the serious look of an Irish terrier and the fine soldier-like tail on him of a Pomeranian and the coat of a retriever and the noble sad eyes of a poodle. In short, my lord, he's not so much of a dog as the epitome of all the dogs that ever ran round this world in four legs. I see. What do you think he's worth? Well, well, Patsy, what do you think, my lad? <laughs> oh, we'll say six and eightpence, maybe. So that uh, if he was stolen, Mr. Cassidy, he wasn't stolen for his money, then? Oh, he was not, my lord. You can make your mind easy about that. Uh, very good, Mr. Cassidy. That'll do, I think. Unless, uh... Uh, Mr. Burden, would you like to examine the witness? Oh, Lord, no. I don't want to start him off again. You may stand down, Mr. Cassidy. Call Honoria Gigan or Flanagan. Honoria Gigan or Flanagan. Honoria Gigan or Flanagan. Now, Mrs. Flanagan, will you cast your eyes on the people sitting at their table? I will, that, Your Honour, and proud I am to see their nice, honest faces. Hello, my wee Patsy. <laughs> do you see anyone you know? I do that. How are you, Mr. Burton, sir? And and now you'll be all right, ma'am, dear. Don't you be worrying yourself. Behave yourself, witness. Sure, I'm doing my best. When did you see this gentleman last? Out in the passage beyond, and says he to me, how's Patsy? And says uh, I... Never oh, mind nice. that. Hey. When did you see him last before that? Ah, oh, when he brought Patsy back to his loving mother, didn't he, darling? When was that? It was the night they gave the provost his walking orders, poor sir. On the 27th of January? It was that. About 7 o'clock? It was. He waited about till Earl McKellar went into the pub, and then he got through a window in the basement, and they fetches my Patsy back to me, my God, behind him. How do you know? Wasn't he after telling me himself? I see. Did the panel Bowden give any reason for his conduct? Sure, there was no need. Sure, I knew that he knew that I knew that he knew. You'll see it all in the paper, Your Honour. Mr. Thompson, not fit to be provost. He doesn't like dogs. Uh, it uh, doesn't quite say that. Well, anyhow, the next provost will be all right. What do you mean? Well, he'll take the rates off the little dogs. <laughs> <laughs> now, Mrs. Flanagan, do you mean to say to his lordship that the panel stole this dog simply because he was a dog lover? Well, he's a nice fellow, anyhow. I understand that you've got good reason to think so. That I have. He raised a subscription for you, didn't he? He did, God bless him. How much did it come to? Oh, sure, now. You won't be asking that. Come along now, answer my question. With Earl McKellar sitting there listening with all the ears of him and all and all. Answer my question. And you're on oath. Well, well that's true, too. Well, sir, it was... It was £327, nine and sevenpence halfpenny. I don't know who gave the halfpenny, so I do. <laughs> How much of that did you give him? Him? Mr. Burden! Would I dream of offering him a penny and him a gentleman? Mr. Burden, do you wish to cross-examine this witness? Uh, what? 
Oh, no, my lord. Then, Mrs. Flanagan, you may stand down. Oh, God bless your honour. And her ladyship, if so be, there's such a lucky woman as to be wet to your holiness. Thank you, ma'am. And now sit down and be quiet. This is my case, my lord. Are you calling any witnesses for the defence, Mr. Burton? Oh, no, no, my lord. Do you wish to give evidence on your own behalf? No, thank you, my lord. Mr. Fiscal? My lord, I don't propose to detain your lordship long. This case is important only on account of the principle it involves. On the face of it, it is a case of theft. But there is more behind it than that. And I would crave your lordship to take a serious view of the case and, if I am correct in my contention, deal with it in an exemplary fashion. Uh, there is no doubt that the panel abstracted the object in question from public custody. The offence as libelled has been proven up to the hilt. And the only point that exercised the crime has been the question of motive. Now, why should the panel put himself on the wrong side of the law for a worthless little mongrel dog. Lord, I humbly submit that the motive aggravates the offence. This is only one of a long series of actions in which the panel has interfered in the most irresponsible way with the public affairs of the borough of Becky. I uh, humbly submit to your lordship that you should not only find the panel guilty as libelled, but that you should make a very sharp example of him indeed. There is my case. <laughs> now, Mr. Burton, will you be good enough to address the court in your own defence? In your own interests, I should advise you to be as brief as possible. Uh, well, my lord, so far as I understand it, I am accused of stealing this dog. In a simple, crude language, that is the accusation. Well, I don't know anything about the law, but it seems to me that before you steal a thing, or a dog, from a person, the thing has got to belong to that person. Uh, will you kindly say that again, Mr. Burton? Well, has the Corporation of Bakey proved ownership of Mrs. Flanagan's patsy? I'm only asking for information. Oh, you've wakened up at last, Mr. Burton. Has it, Mr. Fiscal? Uh, well, um, if your lordship pleases, you have the document there. Which document? The one, um... Ah, here it is. The dog was handed over to the custody of the town clerk by the chief constable. But who handed it over to the custody of the chief constable? It's Mrs. Flanagan's dog. It always has been Mrs. Flanagan's dog. And but the dog was confiscated. Confiscated? My foot... The only evidence before the court that it belongs to anybody is that chit that calls on Mrs. Flanagan as the owner of the dog. The owner, mind you, to pay a preposterous and illegal... Stop, tap. stop, stop. You claim you are acting as agent for the rightful owner. Of course. Well, didn't you hear Mrs. Flanagan's evidence? Mr. Fiscal, this raises a point on which I should like to hear you. The animal was confiscated under... Um, by law 1,276 sec A sub sec D. But, Mr. Fiscal, you can't confiscate property under bylaws. And municipal authorities can't impose indirect taxation. Well, why didn't you say that before? Because I didn't know until my learned friend, Mr. Cahoon, pointed it out during the recess. And I, as taxpayer, pay you to keep me right on things like that. And here we go, wasting endless time and money on this sort of tomfoolery... Mr. Which Burden, <laughs> I have been very patient today. I've surprised myself by my patience. But it is almost exhausted, sir. Sit down. <laughs> Mr. Procurator Fiscal, in the light of what has just been disclosed, I have no alternative but to find the panel, Francis Burden, not guilty. <laughs> Vicky! Oh, hello, Willie. Got back from Paris? Uh, yes. Did you have a pleasant trip? Uh, no. Uh, Vicky, I want to speak to you. But I want to speak to her too. Then you'll have to wait. Vicky, this is very important. Then you'd better come round for tea. 
Four o'clock? You know the house. You're still paying the rent. Uh, no, this is urgent. Frank, perhaps you'll go for a little walk. I'll do nothing of the sort. Really, Willie has the prior claim. Why the hell should he? He's still my husband, Frank. Will you kindly stop saying still this and still that? I can't stand it. It won't be long now, Willie. Frank, please. Oh, all right. You've, uh, you've heard that Elizabeth ran away from me. Oh, Willie. Why? Vicky, I didn't realise it before, but Elizabeth is a brainless, empty-headed ass. She told me to my face that I was a crashing bore, me. I have held 2,000 people spellbound in the St Andrews Hall at Glasgow, and I've never been called a bore before. You didn't find me a bore, did you, Victoria? No, dear. But will you please say what you have to say and go? I don't feel equal to an argument. Oh, it's not easy to say. I'm not a man who's accustomed to ask favours. I'm not a particularly vain man, but I've always been very sensitive and reserved, and a lot of people have mistaken that for pride. Yes, they're apt to do that. Oh, please, go on. Well, not to put too fine a point on it, I want you to forgive me. Forgive you? Yes. After all, I haven't had much fun out of my... No, I don't suppose you have. Oh, well... What about it? Oh, of course I forgive you. But I'm not going to stop the divorce proceedings. I'm not coming back to you on any account. But, Victoria, you said you'd forgiven me. Yes, I did. But that's a very different thing from being bothered with you for the rest of my life. But this will ruin me. The divorce will ruin me. I'm sorry, but it can't be helped. Don't you love me anymore? Not anymore? I'm afraid not, dear. But why? It's not that damn reporter fellow, is it? Why don't you love me? Because for once in a way, I agree with Lisbeth. No, go away. I'll do nothing of the sort. I know I treated you badly, but it was under grave emotional stress. I have apologised. I'm willing to make all the amends in my power, but I will not be treated like this, do you hear? Oh, Willie, don't be so awful. Don't let's have it all over again. I am not awful. I'm cut to the heart. I repeat, you have no right. What's all the shouting about? Mind your own business. What the devil do you mean by bawling and yelling at this lady? I'm not bawling and yelling. Yes, you are. Now get the hell out of this. What's that you say? You heard what I said. The next thing will be a rousing smack on your fat chops. Oh, don't you dare threaten me. Do you know who I am? Yes. You are a pompous, blethering, empty-headed mouth. The poor devils that made you provost thought they were voting for a man, but it was only a melodious noise. <laughs> now, no, not a word. Just shut up and listen. We are sick of your noise in this locality, and this lady is not to be annoyed by your cringing or your bullying. Now, this won't be the first place I've kicked you out of. I'll count three before I punch your face in. One, two... Uh, what the devil do you mean by, by one, two? I'm not going to fight you. Oh, well, that alters it, of course, doesn't it? Oh, you, you, you're a snake in a grass. Yeah, and you're a carbuncle on the public's neck. You shall hear from my solicitor. Oh, that'll be very nice indeed. Oh, dear. You men. Was he asking you to go back to him? You're not thinking of going back to him. You wouldn't think of that, would you? No, no. Oh, thank God for that. Oh, thank God for that. Oh, Victoria, if, if you'd gone back to live with him, I'd have shot myself. Now, you won't believe it, but I would have. Victoria. Oh, Victoria, when I came into your drawing room, you know, you were there with the electric kettle... I knew it was all up. I didn't give a damn, I thought. And when you shook hands with me, it was like getting a knock on the head with a hammer. Oh, I say, let's go somewhere. For tea or anything, will you? All right. The kettle is still working. Oh, oh Victoria. <laughs> Here, this is no place for us. Ah, don't go, Mrs Flanagan. Mrs Flanagan, Mrs Thompson and I are going to be married. Oh. Do you hear that, Honoria? Yes, I hear it. Oh, good luck to you, Mrs. Thompson. Well, well, eh, what about us? You hold your wheeze, you. I'm sick tired of you. What has he been doing, Mrs. Flanagan? Oh, ma'am, what hasn't he? McKellar, McKellar, McKellar. Come, come, come. Well, I'm telling her there's my rooms in the town hall free and seats at all the carnivals and banquets and her well provided. Provided, for is it, Mrs. Thompson, darling? It looks like I'd have to provide for myself and Patsy and Earl McKellar and the feathers pop into the bargain. Oh, why not? Now, Honoria. 
We'll put Patsy's basket where his box was. Out of the draft? Aha. Uh -huh. Beside the fryer? Aha. Uh -huh. And uh, what does your mother see to that, Patsy? His mother says, Patsy, kiss your new daddy. <laughs> <laughs> That was Storm in a Teacup by James Bridie. Victoria Thompson was played by Maeve Alexander, Francis Burden by Paul Young, and Provost Thompson by Tom Watson. Maggie, Jennifer Angus, Lisbeth Skirving.